Here we go. So we're going to talk about the, uh, the third input data, um, and that's the perception thresholds or threshold data. So, so here's the overview of some of the topics we're going to discuss in this presentation. So we'll cover, you know, what is a perception threshold, um, when to use a perception threshold, how to enter that into RMC best fit, and then strategies for uh, defensible perception thresholds. So how to defend what you um, selected. As you can imagine, there's going to be some subjectivity to this. So in RMC best fit software, so, you know, one of the types of input data, of course, is called the threshold data. Um, this presentation will cover a brief refresher of Bolton 17C flow frequency guidance uh, focused on flow perception thresholds, and we'll also demonstrate how to enter perception threshold input data into best fit. Okay, so what exactly is a perception threshold? So a perception threshold is defined, it defines the, okay, so it defines a boundary between floods above the threshold that would have been observed and documented if they had occurred, and floods below the threshold that occurred but were not observed. So perception threshold is defined by a flow value called the threshold and a period of time. So by assigning the perception threshold and time period, we get, we're saying that if there had been a flood uh, greater than that threshold during this time period, um, that the flood would have been observed. So since no floods were actually observed during this time period, this means that the flood that did, the floods that did occur must have been less than that threshold. So in other, in other words, when uh, we do not have observations or data for specific floods during a period of time, we can still infer that floods were less than some magnitude based on the available data that we have. Um, so thresholds can either be estimated directly or indirectly. So direct thresholds are typically based on some physical characteristic. So for example, if a courthouse hasn't been flooded before, you know that there is some limit to that threshold. So that's a direct threshold. That's a direct relationship, right? A physical relationship. So indirect thresholds are typically based on other observed floods. So for example, all other floods must have been less than the largest known flood. Uh, so if it was back in 1882 and the next data points, 19, whatever, 25, you have the largest, we know that was the largest flood. We know they would have recorded a flood. There's historical information that says this is the largest flood since 1925. So now we have knowledge. Uh, that nothing is greater than that threshold. So shown here is another example of a chronology plot to illustrate the threshold concept. In this example, the indirect perception threshold um, is based on knowledge that the historical event is larger than the known flood that occurred during the historical period. Um, this means that all the other unobserved annual maximum flows during the historical period must have been less than that largest observed historical event. So a perception threshold defines the region where floods can observe and and recorded if they occurred. <clears throat> the complement of the perception threshold range is the flow range that defines the range of flow values that occurred but were not directly observed. So in this example, the threshold comes from the knowledge that a historical flood is the largest known flood. So thresholds can be used to represent knowledge about flows during periods when we have no direct observation as a, available, right? So in this example, um, the systematic gauge recorded was discontinued. So however, when we can estimate a threshold using engineering judgment, uh, based on the knowledge that no large floods occurred since the gauge was discontinued. Uh, this threshold can be based on a value that captures the range of typical floods, flood, typical flood magnitudes that were observed during that systematic period. Um, you, basically, you're just using some engineering judgment there. So in this example, <clears throat> there were two historical, two observed historical floods, uh, which are displayed as those flow as those flow intervals. So knowing that um, decent flood records have been kept since, say, the town was established in 1889, 
combined with design reports describing that the flood of 1905 as the largest observed flood since the town was established provides use with enough evidence to establish some thresholds for the unreserved floods. So even though we don't have any systematic flows during the historical period, uh, we can still make inferences about the flows during that period, right? So in this example, two perception thresholds, uh, let's see, are, so two perception thresholds are entered based on the magnitudes of the two historical flood events. So in USAIS and Bureau of Reclamation, paleo flood studies are routinely performed uh, for higher level dam safety studies. Uh, the analytical paleo flood analysis approach uses field um, identification of ge geologic and geomorphic evidence um, of past flood, uh, past large floods, really. The graphic shown here provides, uh, provides examples of features commonly used, it's a little hard to see, hopefully, but you can see it, commonly used in a paleo flood analysis uh, to estimate um, or constrain flood stages. So as we discussed in the previous lecture, when positive evidence of a large prehistoric flood is discovered, it's called a paleo stage indicator or a PSI. So flow estimates associated with a paleo stage indicator are typically modeled and best fit as interval data because we have some knowledge of that. <clears throat> so examples of direct evidence are uh, like say like floated debris or scarred trees that can be age dated using uh, radiocarbon 14 dating or other modern dating methods. So when there is evidence of that an area has not been inundated by a flood um, or by a flood event over a certain period of time, or in other words, when there is evidence that there is, there is not, okay, there's evidence that there has been long-term stability at an elevation we call that a paleo flood non-exceedance bound. So any B, so stable terra, stable soil means it hadn't been flooded, right? So an example um, of the evidence of a non-exceedance bound is discovered, uh, is discovery of a stable terrace, right? So a stable terrace with well-developed soil. So flow estimates associated with non-exceedance bounds are typically modeled and best fit as perception thresholds. And thankfully we have geologists on the team to help us understand all that and we'll just plot it in there <laughs> um let's see here all right now let's walk through the process for entering thresholds into best fit software so the first step is to create of course an open and input data set in the project explorer window um, next is to navigate to the perception threshold tab so <clears throat> a new row or rows can be added to the table by selecting the add rows button um, to the bottom of the table so this should be pretty familiar at this point it's just a different tab so values for each perception threshold can then be added to the table either manually or by or by copying and pasting from another application so again you'll probably just be type hand typing these in because you're not going to copy a whole bunch but each perception threshold requires a time period defined by a start year and the in year along with the threshold type so chronology plots will automatically update as you enter the threshold information. Um, so the recommend, recommended best practice is to avoid thresholds that overlap other systematic or interval data. Um, in this example, you may notice that three um, thresholds have been entered, really, so two thresholds have been entered to avoid overlapping the historical flood around 1898. So there's a threshold that goes up to up to and after 1898, and that's the, you could have just done one threshold through it, but best practices is to go ahead and separate that out so they're not overlapping. <clears throat> so last topic I'll cover in this presentation um, are just a few strategies for developing a defensible perception threshold. So remember that thresholds are used to represent floods that have not been directly observed, but whose magnitude can be judged to be less than some value based on other evidence. So this evidence can come directly from physical features. For example, uh, flows below a gauged base of a crest stage gauge are not recorded. So that would be a, a physical reason. Um, thresholds can also be based on indirect evidence, such as knowing that a particular flood during a given time period is the largest observed flood. 
So therefore, all of the of the uh, all the um, unobserved floods during that same time period should have been less than that largest flood. So remember, uh, again, a best practice is to avoid overlapping perception thresholds um, with observed systematic and interval data. And finally, uh, less is more. Don't get carried away by tight, you know, trying to model too many thresholds. So and you'll see an example of that here in a little bit. So here are a few additional strategies for developing defensible perception thresholds. Um, so trust the evidence and use your engineering judgment. Sensitivity analyses um, is always a good way to explore how much the frequency curve would change if you were to select a different threshold. Um, so higher, lower, longer, or shorter. And, and finally, document the rationale for the threshold you selected, even, even when it's subjective or uncertain. You still want to document through your thoughts on how you got where you got. So, all right. Do you notice anything of concern in this example or anything we might have talked about that you would improve? Anybody? Is that for you? Yeah? So, yeah. So, the overlapping thresholds, right? So, um, the nice thing is, the reality is, best fit handles this just fine. This is mathematically inside the software. It, it, takes care of this for, it takes care of it for you. However, it does sometimes confuse what's actually going on to somebody, if you're, if, especially if you report it or if you come back later. Um, what's really taking precedent might be misunderstood. So for best practices, we like to just separate those out so that it's just clear where the intervals are, what the priority is, though the model does mathematically take care of it if you do put perception thresholds across there. So, All right, here's another example. So you notice anything fun about this one? Where would you improve it? So too many, too many what? Everything. <laughs> yeah, too many intervals, too many perception thresholds. And you said something else like there's a lot of low ones, right? Yeah, the lower thresholds aren't really speaking to us. So we could probably use something higher. So yeah, so instead of representing, like, if you have this much uncertainty across this span of time, it's probably better just to go ahead and use a few higher intervals of historic floods, the bigger floods that we know of, and then just use perception thresholds within there because this represents similar the uncertainty that the other one was showing. So, 